Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are into our 30th season, I talk to poets about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished in the past, what they're planning for the future. It's a wider net than that, though. We have on other sorts of writers, novelists, uh, editors, journalists, short story writers. We even have occasionally other brands of artists. We have had on musicians, actors, sculptors. So if you have an idea for a poet or other brand of artist who might be a guest for the writer's block, watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd be very happy to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of Studio 1623 is a result of cable access television. Don't pay attention to those dish ads. You stick with cable and be loyal to the writer's block and all our other wonderful programming. I'm very happy today to say that we do have a writer uh, as a guest, and her name is Janice Petrie, and she will be talking about her novel, which just came out about a year ago, Bay State Sky. And sky, S-K-Y-E, not the sky that's above us, but S-K-Y-E, named uh, the name of a, a boat named after uh, the daughter of one of the characters. For my introduction of Janice, I'm going to read from the back of her novel. Bay State Sky is the fifth book by this award-winning author, other books by Janice S.C. Petrie include an historical nonfiction entitled Perfection to a Fault, A Small Murder in Ossipee, New Hampshire, 1916, and three illustrated children's books. Uh, we're going to mention those later again. The Bumpy Lumpy Horseshoe Crab, Did You Make the Hole in the Shell in the Sea, and Something's Tugging on My Claw. Petrie's family has been involved in the seafood business for two generations. Her interest in the industry was piqued after spending several years working in the trade itself, which led to her inclination to tell this story. And it's an interesting story. We'll talk about it, the book after I want to get some intro facts from Janice. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, where did you grow up, Janice? Did you grow up uh, here in New England? I did. I grew up in Wakefield. Wakefield. Uh, yeah, went to Wakefield way, High. Way, way, way down the line. Exactly. <laughs> about a half hour away. About a half hour. Uh -huh. And did you, you went to Wakefield High? Mm -hmm. And then where else did you go? I went to Framingham State College. It was college back then. Yeah. And uh, I graduated with a bachelor's in education. Now it's a university. I it is. Right. I have a friend, good friend teaches there. Uh -huh. Then did you go anyplace else for writing or... Well, I got my master's degree in education with a concentration in reading, oh. and that's what piqued my interest in uh, books and writing. And I worked with a lot of uh, reluctant readers, <laughs> and I, I knew if I did decide to write something, I wanted to be sure that not only did it inform, that it also entertained. Uh -huh. um, and uh, then I went to uh, Salem State College for a bachelor's in graphic design. Oh, wow. Well, it was in art with a concentration you in graphic got a lot design. Of degrees after I your do. Name. It was just I wanted to learn how to do yeah. certain things, and three more courses got me a degree, so I thought, why not? Sure. Um, but I wanted to learn how to format books so that I could do it myself. Uh -huh. And um, so, in the process of learning to format books, I found out that I was pretty decent at uh, drawing by hand and illustrating on the computer. And that's what led me to be able to do the Sea Animal series of the children's books. Oh, that they, and we're going to show those a little later right, after right. we talk about uh, uh, Bay State Sky. I was also interested in what you did in the fishing industry that gave you the background and the, and the drive to write uh, Bay State Sky. Right. Well, I worked at Steve Conley Seafood um, as an assistant plant manager for a number of years. And so I learned the inside story of how everything worked and also made connections that way. Uh, we buy a lot of fish at Connelly's. Do you really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> My wife is down there all the time, and I'm down there sometimes. Great. Uh, good, good stuff, good, fresh stuff. Mm -hmm, definitely. Uh, 
I had a big question. Okay. I mentioned before we went on the air. Mm -hmm. That has to do with the basic nature of the fishing industry that you talk about. This is not a real glamorous book like uh, the 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 horrible the savage sea and <laughs> people fighting fighting for their lives. It's about the industry right. and the good and the bad and the ugly. <laughs> and the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, yeah there's cheating in here. Mm -hmm. There's murder. Mm -hmm. There's uh, <laughs> shipwrecks. There's all kinds of. Well, there's a haunted, this, this, this ship and the, the people who touch it are haunted, sort of. Um, tell me the significance of the title, the, the boat, and how this opens. Well, um, I came to write the book because I had a lot of connections, and I noticed that there wasn't a lot of, um, there weren't a lot of books written about um, the industry as a whole. There were more books about, as you said, you know, the, the treacherousness of the sea and fishing. And um, I wanted to explore the whole industry. And I did some interviews with some, a whole bunch of lobster fishermen who I knew. And I asked them a bunch of questions, but one that I asked was, what was your worst at fishing what was your best? And I thought they were kind of mundane questions, but it actually gave me the theme for the book because their best day, of course, was they caught a lot of lobsters. But the bad day, I thought it would be the opposite where, you know, they didn't catch anything. I figured they'd say, well, you know, the water was cold, it didn't warm up, the lobsters didn't go into the traps, yeah. they weren't moving, and so we didn't catch anything. But that's not what they said. What they said was the worst day, every single one of them, the worst day at sea that they ever had was a day that they lost a significant amount of their gear. A significant amount of of their gear, their fishing gear, the lobster traps, their trawl lines. Because of storms or because of storms, because of trawlers, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. dragger boats um, trawling through their lines. I thought perhaps you were going to say uh, almost drowning. I know that happens occasionally. It does. That uh, you get trapped by a line mm -hmm. and sucked under, and you don't. I know Peter Private a number of years ago died that way. Right, and there are a few um, stories about that in Chapter yeah. Three, and yeah. those are all true stories that I heard from I, the, yeah, the I lobster fishermen. Mention you, you do cover the whole industry. There's a great deal about lobstering mm -hmm. in here, but also also fishing. Oh yeah. You talk about lobster boats and initially right away uh, a trawler. Right. So right. what? Tell me about the discovery of the Bay State Sky here. Well, when I did the interviews with the lobster fishermen, um, one lobsterman told me a story, which is in Chapter 3, the real story. Um, and I thought it was so intriguing that I altered the story a little bit and made a new ending. And um, I used it as a vehicle to um, kind of combine my other stories and, and kind of push them along through the book, um, solidify them with the story of the Bay State Sky. I know you don't waste any time. Mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the May anime? Anime. The, an, anime. Right. Jimmy and Maris boat. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're coming home. Right. And they encounter the drifting uh, Bay State Sky right. with Nobody on it. Exactly. I won't. I'm not going to do any spoilers. Here, okay. <laughs> but nobody on it, and no explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that's in the first chapter. Right. Right away. So it's bang, 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 and exactly. it continues uh, to move along. Mm -hmm. uh, on the on the feel of the whole book, I told you I was going to answer ask this before the show. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me what Gurry is, Gurry. and why is that significant throughout? The whole book. Right. Well, gurry is the fish byproducts, the offal, um, the, the racks and heads and what is left over from the fish processing. Um, and it's really, really important that the fish processors have a way to get rid of that. Um, they, to a certain degree, will sell some of it to lobster fishermen for bait. Um, they actually tried to make fertilizer out of it, which has been they, a more successful enterprise they, they, they nowadays. Drive, they drive to farms in there. They? they do drive to farms in there, yes. We, when, when it was a crude industry <laughs> rather than more perfected like it is yeah, today. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that, so that is a, the kind of in, uh, underbelly of Current, the industry yes. that people don't talk about. Right. Why did you uh, focus on that? Because of the politics or the economics or 
I, I wanted to focus on that because, um, I don't know if you know, but Steve Conley's my father. And you didn't know. <laughs> no, I didn't. So um, he was very, very involved in that whole Gurry, when the Gurry plant, the dehydration plant, shut down. The state shut it down. Uh, it, it smelled, and I'm sure it did, and there were lots of complaints, and so they shut it down. And he was involved in first trying to purchase it, getting all of the seafood processes together and purchase it. And when that didn't work out, he kind of was in charge of what to do with what was mounting up at the state fish pier to begin with, and then what were they going to do in the future without a dehydration plant. So you were able to directly use that in here? Oh, yes. I did a lot of interviews with him in order to use that information. I bet he was a cooperative interviewer. Too. He, yeah, for the most part, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I think so. Right. But people who were involved in um, everything that happened with that um, have told me that it was really accurately written and that they thought that it did a, did a good job telling what happened. And I, I just didn't want those stories to be yeah. lost when that generation died off. Did the confrontation with the governor actu actually happen? Oh, yes, yes, I yes. I want that check? Mm -hmm. oh. All that governor. <laughs> Ooh, was that Dukakis? Yeah. I didn't mention his name, but yeah. yes. My father still well, I was thinking, like I was thinking Governor when, Dukakis. <laughs> this is set in the past, 1990. 1990, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was trying to think who would be in office Dukakis. then here in Gloucester and who would be uh, um, in the a state rep and who would be in the governor's office. And uh, so I, I guessed him right. right. Uh, so you had a lot of personal experience from your working background mm -hmm. and family and everything. Right. And it went right in there. Yes. Have people come up to you and say, is, is that me or is that my buddy? Is that, is that <laughs> they someone? They have, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually was watching the um, dory races. Um, at the back of you know the dock at Steve Conley's, and one of the fishermen who I interviewed uh, came up to me and said, "So who am I in the book?" <laughs> and then he started to go through all the other people and you know places. I did change the name of a few places, which I probably shouldn't have bothered because most people knew what they were anyway if they were local. But uh, yeah, a lot of people have done that. It was kind of like, have you ever read the book The Help? You know, and people are trying to figure out who they were in that book. Well, this is sort of the same thing where. Uh -huh. Yeah, because most of the people in the book, um, save uh, Congressman Contoro, uh, are people that I know. Congressman Contoro is totally made up. I had to have someone to have a little fun with, and he just fit in. So. I was thinking of uh, Tony, uh, Tony Verga was in office then, maybe? Uh-huh. Probably, yeah. Now, I'm embarrassed. I, I asked you your, your maiden name. Right. And you said Conley, and then you're talking about Conley. No connection. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know. That's okay. I have uh, some other questions I want to. The, there's a con artist in here who disguises himself as a priest. The fake priest. Is that? That happened. That happened. That happened. Um, it happened to Steve Connolly's seafood in exactly the way that I portray it happening. The only difference is when I originally wrote the book, it happened in Boston. It didn't happen in Gloucester uh -huh. because they have a branch in Boston too. And the body was actually discovered in Boston Harbor. Um, I had to move it up to Gloucester for the continuity of the sure. book. Sure, it's fiction. Exactly, so it's fiction. I right. had I, I had the uh, right to do it, and but that, uh, yeah. You won't say how the priest, the no. phony priest, winds up in the water. It was a crazy story, though, and it totally true. Other than the fact that it happened in Boston rather oh. than in Gloucester, but it happened oh. to Steve Conley Seafood. Yeah, I was. I was thinking when I was reading it, these priests are find a lot of crazy ways to be bad. Of course, he's not, <laughs> he's not, a, really, not really a no, priest. No, and, and that's kind of what, met, what made him meet his demise was the fact that he was impersonating a priest. Um, I'm interested in, uh, I want to read some pages, page numbers off here. Um, there's a number of places where you mention or one of the characters will mention on page 87, page 154, page 226, and page 261, and I think a couple other places, a character will say, as the character Denny says, or Paul says to Denny, it's unfathomable to me that the misfortune connected with the Golini's boat would be contagious to anyone who was in contact with its catch. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> other similar lines are on the other number of pages I mentioned, 154, 226, 260, and, and a couple other places, I think. Mm -hmm. Where did, so the, the boat, the Bay State Sky, which right. is owned by the Golini brothers, right. seems to have some dark, ominous fate attached to it. Where mm -hmm. did that idea come from? Um, because it works. It does. And it's funny, I, I had the ending of the book before I had the book itself, which is really kind before of... Before you had the... Before I really um, had fleshed out the story, I knew what the ending was going to be. So um, it kind of all you mean just, fit. Well, I don't want to say what the Yeah, ending you can't is. say what the ending is. It's <laughs> somebody, I actually I was doing a book signing sale thing a couple of weeks ago, and Somebody who works in Gloucester in the industry walked by when I was talking to somebody about Bay State Sky, and um, he said, oh, I read that book. He said, what an ending. You'd never have guessed a girl would have written it. <laughs> and I just thought that was so funny. Uh, number one, I'll never be called a girl again, <laughs> you know? And yeah. number two, he really, really liked the ending. So, um, yeah, I've gotten a lot of uh, people have spoken about the ending, but they, it was oh. it was a surprise, and yet they loved it. It, it is a surprise. Yeah, it's on the second last page, I think, when, mm -hmm. when something happens. Right. I'm not going to mention. Uh, a friend of mine the other day was talking about a girl doctor. He went to see a girl doctor, <laughs> and everybody around him said, "Come on, what what right. what, what decade are you in? What century are you in?" So, the haunting. It works, and, it, and it, you partly had it because you had the ending. Mm -hmm. There's a haunting ending. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever tried ghost stories before? Because this is almost perfection to a fault. Is it starts out that way with a a haunting. Oh, the the, the murder in Osipi. Mm -hmm. And and that's a true story. That's it is. totally true. I, I that's didn't... journalism. Then. The, it, it's, the other the other book. Yes, it's a historical nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfection to a Fault, A Small Murder in Osipi, New Hampshire, 1916. Right. Just a little over 100 years ago. Right. Crazy story about, um, and totally true, about a man who moved up to Osipi with his wife. Um, he bought a cottage on the lake. Uh, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he uh, left with the high school principal to go to Boston on the train to sell some stock. When he got there, at 10 o'clock that night, his cottage caught on fire with his wife inside, burned to the ground. He had an airtight alibi in Boston, and they accused him of murdering his wife. How could he have done it? And it was in 1916 when forensics and the whole science of criminal justice just wasn't the same as it is now. Yeah. And the way that they went about um, building a case um, was phenomenal. Totally true. Was he guilty? I can't tell you. Uh, well, I don't really know, actually, if he was guilty. Some say he was, some say he wasn't. There's definitely an ending to it. Oh, mm -hmm. I'll have to look But it up. started yes. out with um, the reason what caught my attention about the story was uh, my parents stayed in the cottage there that oh. my um, father's stepfather owned, and they were supposed to stay a week. I was a baby. I stayed there, but I don't have any recollection of it. And um, they were going to stay there a week. They stayed there one night, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, as soon as they could see their boat on the lake and get it on a trailer, they <laughs> got out of town and never went back. Wow. And then about three years later, my father was reading the Boston Globe magazine and read about a horrific murder that happened in a cottage up in Ossipi, New Hampshire. So he called his stepfather and said, could that have been the cottage? And my ste his stepfather said, yes, um, but I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want them to be freaked out when they were in the cottage. So he knew. So I we, wanted to find you, out You have a taste of that happened. kind of haunting a, a little, atmosphere a little bit. It, it, it finds me, kind of. <laughs> a, it doesn't dominate the book. No. The book's moving along. It's talking about the industry, and clearly that's the principal topic. Right. But there are these incidents, mm -hmm. I mean, a, a very bizarre mm -hmm. and disastrous incidents in terms of money and loss of product and... Um, and, and injuries, human injuries, right. uh, that keep coming up on, on all these pages mm -hmm. that, I, that I mentioned. So it's a and most of those incidents are true. Most of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the the loss of the water, with the the lobsters. Who does that? Charlie screws mm -hmm. up. Yeah, that happened. Yeah. I was thinking, well, some of this stuff must happen sometimes. So she borrowed. So 
some incidents. Mm -hmm. The only so one that didn't happen was the fish overturning on Star Drive, or the Northeast, the oh. Southeast Expressway by Star Drive. That didn't happen. I had to do that because that went into the whole Contoro. Uh, I wanted incident. to compliment you on one line. I just marked this line. Somebody, uh, the line is, he was dripping with diplomacy. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very nice line. Thank you. Uh, before we get to talk about the children's books for a minute, I want to ask you where you think the future of fishing, what you think the future of fishing will be in Gloucester? Yeah, um, I have been out of it for a, a little while. I think 2000, 2005 was when I left Steve Conley's. Um, the whole auction is not done the way it is in the book. Um, it's basically somebody, everybody sits on their computer at, at their business and they um, bid on fish that way. So the whole display auction where people come in and they see the fish and then they sit down and yeah, there's more, yeah, there was more camaraderie back then, yeah. you know, where people gathered together in, in groups and now it's more isolated as I, I guess everything is nowadays. So that, that's change. Do you think there will be fishing in Gloucester? I hope so. I know a lot of uh, fishermen that I worked with then that are still fishing now, so that's a good sign, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly uh, a different world. I've been here for 45 years, 46 years, and uh, it's a completely different world than what I moved into. Right. Uh, it was a very, very active, busy fishing community. Mm -hmm. Now it's not very busy fishing community with a lot more commuters. Right. Uh, where do you where do you think Gloucester will be look will look like in 2050? When we do it, we'll do another right. show. Right. 2050. <laughs> we'll do another show talking about uh, your latest novel. Sadly, it must it might turn more to a more touristy seaside village kind of thing rather than a working fishing community. Maybe, you know, there's been a lot of research, ocean research moving into Gloucester, so maybe it will move into more of a, a scientific, technological something kind of like community. Woods, woods Hole or Exactly. It, it could turn into something more like that and less of a fishing community. Yeah. But I would like to have it maintain a little bit of its fishing heritage just because. Yeah. Um, it seems uh, just in the last 40 years since I've been here, it just, it's gone. Right. It's gone. You don't hear all the, all the ships, uh, boats leaving at four in the morning. Right. The engine's <laughs> going. <laughs> <"Rrr."> yeah, <right. laughs> so we live in Magnolia and you can hear mm -hmm. where we are, you can hear the boats, if, the, if they're big boats, coming in and out of the, in and out of the harbor past the breakwater. Right, right. Uh, you have brought some books I did. of a different kind I did. that I mentioned in the introduction. You've done children's. I have, books. and they're using them in schools all around this area, really up and down the eastern seaboard. And uh, the Scudic Institute in Acadia National Park, the rangers are using them there too because they're rhythmic and rhyming and colorful and, and fun, and they teach about the sea animals that live right off the waters off of Gloucester, a lot of these sea animals. I used to collect and do sea animal programs, hands-on programs in schools for years and years and years, starting with working for the New England Aquarium. And um, uh, Could you give, tell me the title okay. of a book and then hand it to me and I'll, I have got a marker here where I have to hold the books up. Okay, that's the Bumpy Lumpy Horseshoe Crab. And the reason I wrote that, that was the first one that I wrote. And I met a group of um, fifth graders up on Crane Beach. And they had a horseshoe crab, and they had a stick, and they had a pail. And they were trying to get into the pail because they wanted to put it back in the water. But they didn't dare pick it up because they were afraid it was going to sting them with, with, their ta with its tail. Uh -huh. And um, I walked up to them, and I picked it up. And they, it was like I was a superhero because I knew I could pick it up, and I yeah. wasn't afraid of being stung. And I taught them a little bit about the horseshoe crab, and then I put it right down with them. And I walked away. And as I got a little bit down the beach, they yelled to me, hey, lady, thanks for teaching us a little bit about the horseshoe crab. And they had it in their hands, and they were picking it up and putting it back in the box. So they're, 
They're converted to saving horseshoe crabs exactly. without fear. Well, bumpy, thought, bumpy the horseshoe crab. I thought, you know, we were always afraid of whales way back in the day. And then we learned about whales. And now we have, you know, sightseeing tours yeah. to go out and, and visit with yeah. whales. So I thought maybe horseshoe crabs and could have the same outcome. This is your art. Yes. And uh, the illustrations inside, of course, are yours as mm -hmm. well. I'll show, not to read, but just one of the illustrations. Now we're all afraid of sharks. <laughs> I know, really. <laughs> Speaking sharks, of sharks. Sharks are being slaughtered. <laughs> Did you make the hole in the shell in the sea? Did you make the hole in the shell of the sea? And what that's about is, have you ever been to the beach and found a perfectly drilled hole in a clam yes, shell? Yes, yes. You make necklaces out of them. Lots of people find them. I saw one this morning Did on Magnolia really? Beach. There you go. Lots of people find them, but not many people know what sea animal drills that hole. And so I wrote a mystery to solve what sea animal drills that hole, that perfectly drilled hole in the clam shell. Are you going to tell us? You have to read the book. It's at the very, very back, <laughs> actually. It could be a sea star. It could be a lobster. It could be a seagull. It could be a moon snail. I saw on the beach this morning a shell put on a little stick uh, through, through a hole that was drilled in the shell uh -huh. and with little stones around it. Oh, no kidding. Monument. <laughs> last, they, last till high time. They made a, made a little sculpture out of it. <laughs> Something's... Something's tugging on my claw. And the teachers in Maine were asking me to write a book for them because in the fourth grade they had to um, do a unit. It was a mandatory unit on lobsters. And I kept telling them, nah, that subject's been done. There's a lot of books on lobsters. Yeah. And then uh, Ron Hemion, who's a lobster fisherman for Conley's, brought me a beautiful blue lobster that one of the kids named George. They're very rare. Oh, yeah. yeah. The one in two million. And uh, there's a picture of him actually in the flap of that book. And it's just gorgeous, cyan blue. Oh, I, I won't hold that up. That'd be too small. But a blue, it looks like it's almost painted. Right. And I took him to schools, and I took him to Barnes & Noble. I was doing book tours with the children's books. Uh -huh. And um, in, in the course of working with him, I thought of that story, which was unique. And I hadn't seen any of the book that um, introduced a very unique um, way that a lobster defends himself, that if something grabs a hold of his claw and he can't let go, then he just drops his claw and he flaps his tail really fast underneath him, swims underneath a rock or a piece of seaweed to hide, and then he can grow a new one, regenerates one. one. That, that's what happens at the end. But of course, he goes on a journey to find out what had a hold of his claw. Because it was important they, for him they, to know that. They regenerate fairly quickly, too. They do. The next time they molt, they'll have yeah. a little claw. And it takes four or five or six moltings for them to get a claw that's just about the size of the one that they I lost. Know there's a lot of research going on with the animals that do regenerate mm -hmm. to find out how we can grab some of that genetic Wouldn't that be magic, wonderful? magic and Sea stars do it. I mean, there are a lot yeah, of crabs. Yeah, a lot yeah. of sea animals do that. We're out of time. I want to show... The primary book we've been talking about, Bay State Sky, a novel based on fact, set in Gloucester by Janice Petrie. You'll like it. Thank you for being with us, Janice. Thank you for having me. I want to thank you in television land, too, for being with us. If you've learned something about the fishing industry from Janice Petrie and both its exciting upside and its maybe little mysterious shadowy downside, then the writer's block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Good night.